in this video we're going to talk about the tympanic portion of the temporal bone which you can see right here um, this is a u-shaped plate of bone as you can see that extends downwards and it's going to form the floor and the anterior as well as the posterior walls of the external auditory canal which is here um, the middle portion of this tympanic mem um, portion is so thin that sometimes a hole can be present within it um, and if that's the case this would be called the foramen of husk although you can't see it on this one this one's not got a um, foramen so it's going to envelop the root of the styloid process. Um, unfortunately, on this bone, the styloid process has been broken off, but you would have been able to see it extending downwards from here. Um, so if you could just imagine that that was there, the styloid process emerges from the inferior surface via the vaginal process of the tympanic portion. Um, the vaginal process is just a thin plate of bone which is going to split and form two laminae. Um, the lateral lamina is going to be continuous with the tympanic portion and the medial one um, from between the two of them is where the um, styloid process emerges. Um, just remember as well, this here was the petrotympanic fissure which I spoke about in um, the petrus section. So this entire um, structure here is the mandibular fossa which is divided by the petrotympanic fissure the anterior mandibular fossa is formed by the petrous section. So here the posterior mandibular fossa is where um, the tympanic portion plays a role in that. And that's the non-articulated portion of the mandibular fossa, just to recap. So again, on an external view, um, the tympanic portion here is going to be inferior and posterior to the squamous portion, this part here. And it's also going to be inferior to the external acoustic meatus opening, which is um, right above the tympanic portion. And then it's also anterior to the mastoid process, which is this part here. You can see that tympanic portion is just anterior to it. Internally, you can't actually see it. Um, it would be around here, but that's because it's going to fuse with the petrous portion, which is this bit extending outwards. Um, and it's therefore going to be located between the petrous and squamous parts, so in between here, um, but a lot more medial to this, so it's you can't actually see it. So posteriorly, so here, um, it's going to be separated from the mastoid portion via the tympanomastoid fissure, which is this part here. If you can see, um, it's going to divide the tympanic and mastoid portions. And this here, the tympanum mastoid fissure is going to carry the auricular branch of the vagus nerve which is going to eventually lead to the stylomastoid foramen um, and as well the tympanic portion is going to form the anterior wall the floor and a portion of the posterior wall of the external acoustic meatus as i said in the squamous part um, that's going to form the roof of it so the rest of the external acoustic meatus is formed by the tympanic part Medially, so more within this structure that you can't really see, there's going to be a narrow tympanic sulcus, which is where the tympanic membrane attaches, which is um, part of both the external and the middle ear, as you'll go on to find out. So it's more commonly known as the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, and it's going to have a vital role in the transmission and the amplica amplification of sound. <clears throat> so more on the external acoustic meatus because it's a really important structure. Um, it's an S-shaped -sh tube which is going to lead from the external environment here where the oracle or the ear would be and it's going to carry sounds in towards the middle ear. Um, there is more about the ex external acoustic meatus and its functional and clinical aspects on this website. So if you want to hear more about that, just go up to the tabs at the top and click on Hearing and Balance. So um, anatomically, the external acoustic meatus is going to be lined by skin and it's formed by two structurally different parts. So it's lateral third, so the third um, immediately as you enter the external acoustic meatus is going to be cartilaginous and it's medial two thirds, so the two thirds within it here are going to be bony. Um, the bony part as well is entirely within the tympanic portion. 
So the first part, the medial third, the cartilaginous portion is about eight millimeters long and it's gonna be continuous with the auricular cartilage of the ear and itself is gonna be formed by elastic cartilage. It then, um, as it approaches the osseous part of the external acoustic meatus, is gonna connect to that via fibrous tissues. And along its length, the cartilaginous portion is gonna contain hairs and glands that will um, secrete sebaceous and ceremonious fluids. And that's going to create a barrier to prevent the invasion of foreign bodies coming from the external environment into the ear. Um, after the cartilaginous portion, it's going to be continuous with the osseous portion, which is about 16 millimetres long, so double what the cartilaginous portion is. It is much longer than the cartilaginous portion, but it's um, a lot narrower as well. So if you cut it in a sagittal section, it's going to look oval shaped. And that's because um, when it ends, the tympanic membrane lies obliquely. So the posterior wall and the roof of the meatus are a lot shorter than the anterior wall and the floor of it. So either you would be able to see the floor extending a lot further and the membrane being at an angle like this. Um, the posterior, posterior superior portion of the osseous portion of the external acoustic meatus is formed by the squamous part. So that's where I was saying that it forms the roof of the external acoustic meatus. That's what I'm talking about there. And that is the tympanic portion of the temporal bone.